Atari is a video game company that started in 1972 and closed in 2001. If you've clicked onto this video, then you know what today is. It's Throwback Thursday. Every Thursday, I'll be releasing a new video of an old video that I did before. These new videos are longer and have more detail than the ones before. If you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button and smash that notification bell so you get notified of my latest video. Be sure to leave a comment or a suggestion for a future video. Thanks for watching. As an intelligent consumer, I wanted to compare Atari Asteroids with other companies' asteroids. But other companies don't make asteroids. I wanted to compare Atari Missile Command with other companies' missile commands. But other companies don't make that either. Finally, I wanted to compare the new Atari Warlords. Unfortunately, other companies don't make it. When it comes to the video games the world wants most, nobody compares to Atari. In 1972, Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney decided to start a partnership called Syzygy, each putting in $250 of their own funds to support it. Bushnell and Dabney had gone to incorporate the firm but found that Syzygy already existed in California. Bushnell enjoyed the strategy game Go and they chose to name the company Atari, a Japanese term that in the context of the game means a state where a stone or a group of stones is imminently in danger of being taken by one's opponent. By August of 1972, the first Pong was completed. It consisted of a black and white television from Walgreens, the special game hardware, and a coin mechanism from a laundromat on the side which featured a milk carton inside to catch coins. It was placed in a sunny veiled tavern by the name of Andy Caps to test its viability. The Andy Cap test was extremely successful, so the company created 12 more test units, 10 of which was distributed across other local bars, and they found that the machines were averaging about $400 a week each. In several cases, where, when bar owners reported that the machines were malfunctioning, Alcorn found that it was due to the coin collector having been overflowing with quarters, shorting out the coin slot mechanism. Bushnell and Dabney decided to release Pong on their own, and Atari Inc. was established as a coin-up design and production company. Using investments and funds from leased pinball machines, they rented a warehouse in Santa Clara to produce Pong cabinets on their own with hired help for the production line. Bushnell had also set up arrangements with local coin-up game distributors to help move units. Atari shipped their first commercial Pong unit in November of 1972. Over 2,500 Pong cabinets were made in 1973, and by the end of production in 1974, Atari had made over 8,000 Pong cabinets. Around 1973, Bushnell began to expand out of the company, moving their corporate headquarters to Los Gatos. From late 1972 to early 1973, a rift in the business relationship between Bushnell and Dabney began to develop, with Dabney feeling he was being pushed to the side by Bushnell, while Bushnell saw Dabney as a potential roadblock to his larger plans for Atari. By March of 1973, Dabney formally left Atari, selling his portion of the company for $250,000. By mid-1973, Atari acquired Cyan Engineering following a consulting contract with Atari. Bushnell established Atari's internal Grass Valley think tank at Cyan to promote research and development of future games and products. Atari secretly spawned a competitor called Key Games in September of 1973, headed by Bushnell's next-door neighbor, Joe Keenan, to circumvent pinball distributors' insistence on exclusive distribution deals. Both Atari and Key could market virtually the same game to different distributors, with each getting an exclusive deal. In 1974, Atari began to see financial troubles and Bushnell was forced to lay off half the staff. Atari was facing increased competition from new arcade game producers, made many which made clones of Pong and other Atari games. In 
Accounting mistake caused them to lose on the release of Grand Track 10. Communication problems led Atari to not accurately track the expense of manufacturing the game. It was initially sold to distributors for a net loss of $100 per cabinet. Although this flaw was fixed, it contributed to a total loss of $500,000 for the company that fiscal year, placing Atari in financial difficulties. Atari sold Atari Japan to Namco for $500,000, through which Namco would be the exclusive distributor of Atari games in Japan. Bushnell had claimed that that deal saved Atari. Gordon further suggested that Atari merge with Key Games in September of 1974, just ahead of the release of Tank in November of 1974. Tank was a success in the arcade, and Atari was able to reestablish its financial stability by the end of the year. Atari arranged a deal with Sears to make 150,000 units by the end of the 1975 holiday season. Atari was able to meet Sears' order with additional $900,000 in investments during 1975. The home Pong console, branded as Sears Telegame, was in high demand that season and established Atari with a viable home console division in addition to the arcade division. The success of Home Pong drew a similar range of competitors to this market, including Coleco with their Telstar series of consoles. In 1975, Bushnell started an effort to produce a flexible video game console that was capable of playing all four of Atari's then-current games. They settled on a pro programmable console with swappable games. Their project, under the codename of Stella, would become the Atari Video Computer System, Atari VCS. Ahead of entering the home console market, Atari recognized they needed additional capital to support this market. They needed a large infusion of funds. Bushnell had considered going public and then tried to sell the company to MCA and Disney, but they passed. Instead, after about six months of negotiations in 1976, Atari took an acquisition offer from Warner Communications for $28 million that was completed in November of 1976, of which Bushnell received $15 million. The company made about 400,000 Atari VCS units for the 1977 holiday season, most which were sold, but the company had lost around $25 million due to production problems that caused some units to be delivered late to retailers. Another one-off device from the Consumer Products Division released in 1977 was Atari Video Music, a computerized device that took in audio input and created graphic displays to a monitor. The unit did not sell well and it was discontinued in 1978. In 1977, Atari opened the first of the Pizza Time Theater, later known as Chuck E. Cheese, based on the pizza arcade concept that Bushnell had from the start. At this stage, the concept also allowed Atari to bypass problems with getting their arcade games placed into arcades by effectively controlling the arcade itself, which also creating a family-friendly environment. Ray Kassar was hired in February of 1978 as president of Atari Consumer Division. His influence on Atari grew throughout 1978, leading to a conflict between Bushnell and Warner Communications. Warner removed Bushnell as chairman and co-CEO of the company, but offered to let him stay on as director and creative consultant. Bushnell refused and left the company. Bushnell purchased the rights for Pizza Time Theater for $500,000 from Warner before leaving. Kasser implemented significant changes in the workplace culture in early 1979 to make it more professional. The changes in management style led to rising tensions from the game developers at Atari who had been used to freedom in developing their titles. The transition from Bushnell to Kasser led to a large number of departures from the company over the next few years. In 1979, the Atari coin-operated games released their first vector graphics game, Lunar Lander. It was a modest success. Their second arcade title, Asteroids, was highly popular, displacing Space Invaders as the most popular game in the United States. 
Atari produced over 70,000 asteroid cabinets and made an estimated $150 million from sales. A project to design a successor to the VCS started as soon as the system shipped in mid-1977. The project resulted in the first home computers from Atari, the Atari 800 and the Atari 400, both launched in 1979. These computer systems were mostly closed systems, and most of the initial games were developed by Atari, drawing from programmers from the VCS line. Sales into early 1980 were poor, and there was little to distinguish the computer line from the current console products. In 1980, Namco produced the arcade game Pac-Man, and it reached the United States market by the end of the year. Pac-Man soon became a nationwide success, surpassing the popularity of asteroids and creating a wave of Pac-Mania. Atari was able to secure an exclusive deal with Namco to be able to convert Pac-Man to home arcade systems, starting with the Atari VCS version. Atari's management believed that the game would be a surefire hit in the same manner as Space Invaders, and reportedly produced more Pac-Man cartridges than VCS systems in circulation. However, little attention was devoted to the game itself, which was being developed solely by Todd Fry. While Fry was able to get a version of Pac-Man on the VCS within the system's limitations, the resulting game was critically panned for many technical issues such as excessive flickering on-screen characters. Pac-Man was released in March of 1982, with Atari running several promotions to increase sales. It sold over 7 million units and ultimately was a best-selling VCS game, bringing in over $200 million. However, because of the poor technical implementation, Pac-Man caused consumers to become more cautious on rushing to pur purchase new games in the future and tarnished Atari's image given that the company was trying to compete against low-quality third-party titles that were starting to flood the market. Atari launched its second major programmable console, the Atari 5200, in late 1982. The unit was based on the same design features that had gone into the Atari 800 and Atari 400 computers, but repackaged as a home console. Alongside the 5200's release, Atari announced it was rebranding the Atari VCS as the Atari 2600 to create a more consistent product naming system. The Atari 5200 did not do well on the market as it lacked backward compatibility with Atari VCS 2600 cartridges. Atari only sold about a million units before it was discontinued in 1984. By the end of 1982, Atari had hired 4,000 additional employees for a total of 10,000 across its three divisions of arcade games, consumer home consoles, and home computers. The company had more than 50 facilities in the Silicon Valley area. For the first nine months of 1982, Atari contributed half of Warner's $2.9 billion revenue and one-third of their $471 million operating profit. The film, E.T., The Extraterrestrial, was released in June of 1982. Atari was able to quickly negotiate a license estimated to have cost Atari 20 to $25 million to make a video game based on the film. The game was programmed by Howard Scott Warshaw, who was given five weeks to produce the game for the 1982 holiday season. Distributors had already canceled orders. This and other games started to stockpile in Atari's warehouses without any sellers. Neither game sold as much as Atari had expected, notably E.T., which was critically panned and later became known as one of the worst games ever made. And of the 5 million copies produced, only 1.5 million were actually sold. Atari's financial trouble continued into the first quarter of 1983 with an operating loss of $45.6 million compared to an operating profit of $100 million in the same quarter in 1982. Atari was still struggling with excess inventory of its Atari 2600 games as consumers had become weary of the quality of Atari games as a result of Pac-Man and E.T. and the Atari 5200 had not been as successful as the 2600. 
So did Atari discount the excess unsold video games to companies like Big Lots or Ross or even the 99 cent store? It was deemed an urban legend. Reports from 1983 stated that as a result of overproduction and returns, millions of unsold cartridges were secretly buried in the Alamogordo, New Mexico landfill and covered with a layer of concrete. In April of 2014, diggers hired to investigate the claim confirmed that the Alamogordo landfill contained many ET cartridges among other games. James Heller, the former Atari manager who was in charge of the burial, was at the excavation and admitted to the Associated Press that 728,000 cartridges of various games, not just ET, were buried. 1,300 cartridges were recovered, but only 10% of them were actually ET games. Atari had gained a poor reputation in the industry. Despite losses, Atari remained the number one console maker in every market except Japan. Nintendo, a Japanese video game company, planned to release its first programmable video game console, the Famicom, later rebranded as Nintendo Entertainment System, in Japan in July of 1983. Looking to sell the console in an international market that same year, Nintendo offered a licensing deal, whereas Atari would build and sell the system, paying Nintendo a royalty. The deal was in the works throughout 1983, and the two companies had decided to sign the agreement at the June 1983 Consumer Electronics Show. However, Coleco demonstrated its new Atom computer with Nintendo's Donkey Kong. Kassar was furious, as Atari owned the rights to publish Donkey Kong for computers, which he accused Nintendo of violating. Nintendo, in turn, criticized Coleco, who owned the console rights to the game. Coleco had legal grounds to challenge the claim, though, since Atari had only purchased the floppy rights to the game, while the Atom version was cartridge-based. Kassar eventually resigned as CEO of Atari in July of 1983 over mounting financial losses, and Warner replaced them with James J. Morgan. Negotiations became protracted after Kassar's departure in mid-1983 and with any deal unlikely to be realized before year-end sales, Nintendo dropped out. Instead, Nintendo worked through their Nintendo of America subsidiary to release the system on their own in 1985. Let's just say Nintendo's success was Atari's loss. Morgan implemented processes to reduce operating costs at Atari, including laying off 3,000 jobs and moving 4,000 more manufacturing positions to Asia. Atari's financial problems continued throughout the rest of 1983 with second quarter losses of $310 million. Atari's problems reverberated across the entire video game industry in the United States as consumer confidence in video games had weakened significantly, contributing significantly to the video game crash of 1983. Retailers became wary of selling video games, making it difficult for console and video game manufacturers to sell their products. Further, the rising popularity of home computers drove sales away from game consoles clear stock as to make way to new games, retailers also heavily discounted consoles and games which also hurt these companies financially. Many of the new companies that had sprung up to take advantage of the rising growth of video games prior to 1983 shut down, liquidating their assets and further contributing to the excess unsold stock. Established companies like Atari faced difficulty in selling their products against these volumes which further contributed to their losses. By the end of 1983, Atari reported a total loss for the year of $538 million compared to the $1.7 billion operating profit in 1982. Any remnants of the home video game business in America all but disappeared. In 1984, Mattel sold off its electronics division. Aaron Greenberg folded Coleco. 
Ray Kassar's successor, Jim Morgan, came from Philip Morris, where his background was marketing cigarettes. This experience hardly prepared him for the video game business. He bragged to employees that his seven-year, multi-million dollar contract gave him freedom to run the company and sell its pieces. Atari's hardware divisions, the video game systems and computers, were sold to Jack Tramiel, founder of Commodore Business Machines, for $240 million in notes. Warner retained 25% of the company. Tramiel believed that his new company, called Atari Corporation, could go up against Apple and Commodore. Tramiel had no interest in the coin-up business. Warner sold it to Messiah Nakamura, and Atari Games became a subsidiary of Namco. Under the agreement, Atari Games could do anything except make hardware or software that competed with Tramiel's Atari Corporation under the Atari name. I look at it sadly, Nolan Bushnell says, surveying the devastation of the company he founded. You can't help but have a certain feeling for a name that you chose out of the universe. He adds, see, Atari could have been Nintendo and Apple under one roof. So what do you remember about Atari? Leave a comment below. Thanks for watching. Hey, if you just watched my video, thanks for watching. Hit that like button and please subscribe to Eric C. Productions.